what I'm going to do today is um, I'll first uh, uh, review um, how we actually reconstruct ocean basins where we have lots of data uh, preserved and uh, how we derive finite stage rotations and uh, uncertainties. And then we move on to uh, reconstructing ocean basins that are now largely vanished. And that's, of course, associated with uh, larger uncertainties. But nevertheless, if we want to get a complete picture of what the Earth looked like, um, uh, through geological time, we've got to take a step at uh, reconstructing uh, vanished oceans. Okay, the second slide um, shows an image of the uh, Western Indian Ocean. Uh, you see Madagascar, uh, so on the left-hand side. And so that's a, a, a nice example. Uh, so this is a gravity anomaly image. And so you, you see a triple junction there, um, uh, lots of fracture zones. And of course, we uh, identify these fracture zone traces from um, gravity anomaly data and combine them uh, with uh, marine magnetic data and to uh, derive finite rotations to reconstruct uh, the motion of the plates relative uh, to each other. And um, so before we get right into the actual reconstructions, I just want to review, uh, so partly following on from what Paul talked about in the previous lecture, um, talking about uh, the different sorts of rotations that we are using. And so in, in the first place, uh, so we are just fitting data from conjugate uh, ridge flanks. Right? And so that means, uh, uh, as displayed on the third slide, right, um, we have uh, um, uh, data on uh, conjugate ridge flanks. We have a schematic mid-ocean ridge drawn here in the middle. Um, and we have uh, sort of two schematic uh, seafloor isochrons uh, that are called time one and time two uh, on both sides. Right? And so in the first place, what we do, say if we want to make a reconstruction for time one, so we want to eliminate all the ocean floor that's formed after time one, and uh, we want to hold one of these plates fixed. We have plate A on the left and plate B on the right. And so say if we fix plate A, then we are going to take all the data um, uh, that belong to this isochron or this um, paleo mid-ocean ridge uh, on plate B and, and rotate them over to plate A. Right? And uh, by um, fitting those data, and these would be both ma magnetic anomaly and fracture zone identifications, uh, together representing the sort of staircase pattern um, of these uh, um, ancient mid-ocean ridges, we derive a finite uh, rotation. And so that's a finite rotation pole, the red dot at the top, and a rotation angle. Right? Now, this rotation has nothing to do with how these plates have actually moved through time. And so how they uh, might have moved in this example is illustrated um, by the blue, uh, the, the couple of blue lines. So we would call these tectonic flow lines. They would correspond to ideal fracture zone traces. Um, and so that there might have been um, a, a reorganization of spreading after time two, um, um, but that doesn't concern us at all for making a reconstruction for time one. Uh, so we, we completely disregard how the plates have actually uh, moved for the moment being and just reconstruct uh, the um, data belonging to the two conjugate isochrons on plate A and B for time one. So if we go to the next slide now, this is, of course, only the uh, beginning. So we, we do this for a whole bunch um, of different um, uh, geological ages, uh, namely those ages for which we happen to have identified um, uh, magnetic uh, anomaly identifications or picks on the ocean floor. And so we end up with a whole set of finite rotations. Right? In this example that's shown here in this slide, we, uh, uh, we show the motion of Australia and India away uh, from Antarctica. Right? And uh, so what's shown here is the, is the actual track uh, of uh, Australia through time. So in, uh, Australia has moved east relative to Antarctica initially and later moved away to the north. Right? And so in, in order to derive this kind of motion from our finite rotations, uh, we, we need to actually compute stage rotations. And so the stage rotations uh, refer to tectonic stages or time intervals and the boundaries of these stages are given by the density of our observations. So if uh, they're essentially given by those magnetic anomalies that we can confidently identify in the ocean floor, and they give us our time markers. And so the stage rotations are obtained by adding two finite rotations for the same plate pair um, for different reconstruction times, and one rotation will have its sign reversed. And so 
by computing a whole bunch of stage rotations, they give us the, the actual path uh, of motion between uh, different plates. Right? And so if you go to the next slide, um, we notice that, so that's a, a schematic representation of stage <coughs> rotations, right? For the same situation uh, that uh, I showed before, um, but now uh, imagine that we have uh, derived two finite rotations for time one and time two. So we have uh, sets of magnetic anomaly and fracture zone picks that, uh, that lie on these uh, uh, green uh, paleo mid-ocean ridges or isochrons on plate A and plate B. And we have now added uh, these two finite rotations uh, for time one and two, one with its sign reversed, and so uh, we then get a stage rotation. Now, the, uh, there's another uh, trick to consider, which is that uh, uh, rotations are not commutative. So that means whether we uh, add uh, uh, rotation A to rotation B with a sign reversed, or do it the other way around, we don't get the same result. And in fact, we get two different stage rotations this way. One in the reference in the fixed reference frame of plate A, and the other one in the fixed reference frame uh, of plate B. Right? So we, we can look at the path that, uh, uh, that a synthetic flow line, a tectonic flow line describes um, uh, in terms of the motion between two plates, either in one or the other fixed reference frame. And so a set of stage rotations are always given in a fixed reference uh, system of a given plate. So if we move to the next slide now, right? um, <clears throat> so how uh, uh, these data from conjugate plates are uh, fitted qualitatively, I mean, has been uh, known for, for a long time. Um, uh, but it was uh, uh, Stephen Hellinger, who was one of John Slater's PhD students at MIT uh, in the early 80s, um, who um, figured out a way uh, to, to better formalize uh, uh, the fitting of data from conjugate plates in terms of uh, applying a least squares technique. Right? And the criterion that he derived at the time uh, is uh, uh, referred to as Hellinger's criterion of fit. And uh, Paul talked a little bit about this uh, in the previous lecture. Um, so we're, we're not going to go into the, the, the details here. Um, but uh, Stephen Hellinger figured out um, uh, how to apply these squares criteria to figure out what the best fit um, between uh, these sets of data are. And the way he did this, he reasoned that you can subdivide a mid-ocean ridge into great circle segments, um, because essentially you have a bunch of straight segments, mid-ocean ridge and fracture zone segments. Of course, we know that fracture zones uh, are theoretically described by small circle segments, but the, unless uh, the fracture zone offsets are very large, the, the difference is negligible. So he figured that you can just uh, uh, represent um, mid-ocean ridge segments as uh, sequences of uh, great circle segments, and Paul outlined that in his previous lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, that was a, a great advance, and we're, we're still using uh, that methodology today. If we now move to the next slide, but there, there was still a remaining problem that we didn't really know how to uh, uh, capture the uncertainties in these reconstructions, even though we had a better criterion for evaluating the goodness of fit, right? And so, uh, in general, of course, uh, as scientists, we, we, try, we have lots of data and we try to make models uh, and then somehow evaluate the fit, fit or misfit of the model with respect of the data, and we, and we need to be able to uh, compute formal uncertainties for this, right? And so we can, we can think of uh, uh, our model as a rotation, and the rotations can be expressed in many different ways, of course, uh, as latitude, longitude, and angle, but we can also think of them as three Cartesian unit vectors in X, Y, Z. And they describe the location the, uh, of the rotation pole and an angle, and corresponding to the length of the vector. Right? And the misfits of the data can be thought of as small Cartesian vectors that correspond to an uncertainty ellipse about that rotation pole. Right? And, uh, uh, so what we have to keep in mind is that the model is described by four parameters uh, in, in this representation, x, y, z, and angle, whereas the misfit in the data is only described by three parameters, namely an uncertainty ellipse and x, y, z. So if we move to the next slide, right, um, <clears throat> um, both um, uh, uh, John Stock and Peter Molnar, as well as Ted Chang, um, uh, recognized uh, 
um, that uh, there's a similarity in this problem uh, with map projections. Of course, in map projections, we have an analogous problem that we have uh, uh, the spherical surface of the Earth, and when we make maps, we need to project these data onto a flat plane, and this is always associated with problems. Right? Only if we make this area, of, the area of our map projection, very small, do we have a linear uh, relationship, and otherwise we get distortions, right, um, because of the curvature of the Earth, right. And so equivalently, the relationship between a finite rotation and the misfit of the data from two plates is, is only linear for very small rotation angles, right. And uh, uh, um, I actually learned um, uh, uh, how, how this works best uh, when I was a PhD student using interactive software um, to, to play around with rotation poles um, by turning knobs and figuring out how changing the lo location, the latitude and longitude, or the rotation angle of the rotation would actually affect the misfit of the data. It's actually very useful to do that. And uh, uh, th there's now, of course, an open source tool available that's the G-Plate software that you can download. Uh, it's a little plug here from www.gplates.org. And in the most recent version of G-Plates, you can, in fact, grab a plate and, uh, and display various data, and, and you can play around with the data this way. You start with a, with a starting rotation pole, and then you can change the latitude and the longitude and the angle. And for large rotation angles, you will then notice that how your data fit, how the, how the magnetic and fracture zone picks from conjugate plates, how well they will fit, or how they will become skewed. It's, it's, a, it's an extremely nonlinear relationship uh, with respect to uh, these three parameters that you're playing around with, the latitude and the longitude and the angle, right? And so what this means is that you cannot actually, that it makes no sense to express the uncertainties of a rotation in terms of the finite rotation parameters themselves. And so that means that statistical principles, right, that, that uh, are based on the concept of expected value, mean, and variance, these are linear statistics, um, they, uh, and the parameters are expected to vary over some linear subspace, that, that, that doesn't apply. Right? And so this is a really important insight. And the, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, this was first uh, recognized uh, by Joanne Stock and Peter Molnar in the early 80s. And they, they played around with this interactively as well. And they, they realized um, uh, that, that because this relationship is so nonlinear, right, you need to look at the uncertainties in terms of what they call partial uncertainty rotations that are usually abbreviated as PURs. Right? So they said, okay, let's first reconstruct the data. This is now shown on the next slide, um, where, where we have two um, uh, sets of points from conjugate plates reconstructed. These are magnetic anomaly and fractures on picks, and there's sort of an, a staircase-shaped isochron drawn uh, through them. Um, and, uh, and so Stock and Marner argued that, uh, uh, that you can then look at three partial uncertainty rotations. Uh, and and there, there, there's three small perturbations to this rotation. And they can be expressed by, uh, by three uh, small rotations, about th three separate rotation poles. And these rotation, one of them uh, is located right in the center of, these, of your spreading system. And that's called the center for skewed fit. One of them is located 90 degrees away laterally, uh, that's called the center for misfit of fracture zones, and the third one is called the center for misfit of magnetic anomalies. So as you tweak uh, uh, rotations about these three poles, so you will either misfit the fit of the fracture zones, magnetic anomalies, or you will skew the fit of these data. Right? And so that was quite an important insight, right? But at, the, but at the time when they came up with this idea, there was no formal uh, method available um, to, to compute these partial uncertainty rotations. So essentially, it was done interactively as well. So you would gaze at the fit of the data, and you, you would, you would uh, tweak these rotation angles, and you would say, ah, now the fit has become unacceptable. Right? And of course, that, even though the insights that were derived at the time were important, um, there was no formal methodology present to do this. And so this was picked up by Ted Chang. Of course, Ted is a, is a mathematician and statistician by training who became fascinated uh, with uh, uh, plate rotations. Right? And so he, he picked up these ideas and, uh, uh, and, and he, uh, he formalized an algorithm, um, and that's described on the next slide. Right? Uh, he, um, uh, he said, well, actually what you can do, you, you uh, use Hellinger's criterion of fit to reconstruct your data. That's step number one. 
And she said, then you use a Taylor series that's centered on this estimated rotation um, uh, that, uh, that this approximate rotation, right? And, uh, and, you, uh, and you use the error sum squares using a linear regression. And, uh, and then uh, you express these, these partial uncertainty rotations uh, with a covariance matrix in terms of the misfits of these data. Right? And so the, his fundamental insight was, uh, as was already uh, uh, stock of Marnas, except for that he formalized it, that the uncertainties in the rotation are best expressed in terms of the deviations of the rotation from the best fit rotation, not in terms of the error in the best fit rotation itself. So that's very important, right? And so uh, when you run uh, the, the um, Hellinger and Cheng uh, 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 programs, the Hellinger 1 program, for example, in your prec, then you will see that it produces a covariance matrix, right? And this covariance matrix uh, directly corresponds to Stock and Marner's partial uncertainty rotations that were qualitative beasts, right? And, and in, the, in a particular way, namely the eigenvectors of this covariance matrix correspond to the rotation pole locations of these three partial uncertainty rotation axes. And the eigenvalues of that matrix correspond to the rotation angles of the PURs. And so uh, if we move on to the next slide, uh, so Chang's method, of course, has been uh, uh, very successfully used. I mean, nearly everyone who's working with relative plate motions uh, is using uh, this uh, methodology um, uh, today. And of course, all his software is open source and uh, downloadable from his uh, website. Um, and, so we, and so we have uh, used this in many ocean basins. Uh, but uh, because it's quite cumbersome to uh, convert all the data into uh, the required format and they also need to be self-consistently identified, uh, we still haven't got to the point where we have uh, a, a global set of rotations that have all been derived in the same way. And so this is, in fact, one of our challenges uh, still to derive global plate models that are all as self-consistent as possible. Right? Now, we do have a current global uh, plate model, but still a bit of a, of a mishmash uh, of qualitatively and quantitatively derived uh, rotations. And so uh, the rotation poles of our latest global plate model were published earlier this year in GQ. And uh, so here's a map of the age of the ocean floor uh, that we have derived by uh, uh, compiling over 40,000 magnetic anomaly identifications in the ocean basins and combining them with uh, uh, various uh, fracture zone traces. Uh, then we, uh, so we reconstruct all this data. We draw, uh, we construct isochrons, uh, uh, our paleo mid ocean ridge outlines. And then we have a set of programs that allow us uh, to, to turn the set of ocean floor isochrons into a continuous uh, grid. Uh, and so that's our age grid of the ocean floor that's uh, in the latest version is shown here on this slide. Now, if we move to the next slide, it's just a bit of an overview of the, of the different kinds of data that, uh, that we're uh, going to be using uh, uh, next, uh, not only to uh, uh, create um, um, a, a digital representation of the age of the ocean floor today, but also to go back through time. And so then it becomes a little bit more tricky because we have to reconstruct the ocean floor that doesn't exist today. And so uh, not only do we need to combine marine gravity and magnetic data and bathymetry, um, but also uh, we look at seismic reflection data from continental margins. Uh, we look at geological data, especially where active margins are involved, because what happens on the overriding plate sometimes gives us some hints as to uh, how subduction has proceeded, especially when mid ocean ridges were subducted we look at the age and type of magnetism, and of course we use ocean drilling data as well. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll just give you an example here um, uh, to illustrate how, how we go about uh, these reconstructions. So this is the a gravity anomaly map of the Enderby Basin in the southern Indian Ocean. So you see the Kerguelen Plateau sitting there um, in the middle, and uh, so th th this was uh, the Enderby Basin between the Kerguelen Plateau and Antarctica in the south, uh, was, was sort of one of the last blank areas uh, in the global ocean where we had, had no magnetic, hardly any magnetic anomalies, uh, these not high quality ones. Uh, because of course you have to grapple with magnetic storms down there as well, so you actually need a magnetic radiometer um, to uh, uh, collect uh, high quality marine magnetic data there. And, uh, but in recent years uh, there have been uh, several uh, separate ca campaigns to uh, collect data there. Um, uh, by the Japanese and also by the Geoscience Australia, 
And so we have, uh, uh, we then combine uh, fracture zone traces that you see in the gravity data here. We go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a, a slide that shows all the uh, more recently uh, acquired seismic and magnetic profiles uh, in, in this area. So not long ago, just a few years ago, the, the, there were hardly any data down there south of Kerguelen, where there's now a dense set of data. And this is largely because the International Law of the Sea Convention, uh, the changes in this International Law of the Sea have prompted many countries to collect geophysical data in places where they would have never gone before voluntarily. And so, of course, for us, uh, uh, those of us who are interested in reconstructing the ocean basins, this was great news because we got access to all these data where we hadn't, uh, didn't have any data before. Uh, if we now go to the next slide, uh, you see a grid of magnetic anomalies. So, uh, yeah, in addition to looking at magnetic anomalies along ship tracks, um, we also use, uh, we also try to grid the magnetic anomalies. We have to use some tricks when the uh, uh, individual ship tracks are quite far away from each other. Um, a spline gridding uh, uh, will often introduce artifacts, even if we use tension. And so we then have to use some additional tricks that we call the cost trend gridding. So in fact, we cheat slightly and, and say, oh, we know the trend of these magnetic anomalies, so we insert some extra points automatically in between the tracks to make the lineations come out better. So that's what we've done here. Um, and we use some criteria that are only, uh, um, we actually use the GMT uh, near neighbor uh, a program to um, create these blobs here, but then we haven't got any data at all, but you see the gray blobs on this image, right? And so you see the set of uh, more or less um, east-northeast trending um, uh, lineations um, that uh, uh, reflect the M anomaly sequence in the Enderby Basin. If we now go to the next slide, uh, it just illustrates how we then create, um, uh, we compare observed magnetic profiles on the right-hand side with a synthetic magnetic profile, uh, sort of an ideal profile of what we would expect the seafloor to look like um, if uh, we have no noise and perfectly symmetric spreading. Um, and uh, by doing this, we then found out that there's an extinct spreading center in the Enderby Basin, um, which was abandoned uh, sometime um, around uh, 120 million years ago and then jumped north. And so, um, um, and so of course, this explains why there's ocean flow down here that has no conjugate on the other side offshore East India. Um, and so we gradually go around the world and piece together um, the spreading uh, histories of individual parts of the ocean basins. Um, and so this is still relatively easy um, where we have uh, conjugate ridge flanks preserved. So if we go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, uh, the next slide uh, shows uh, the uncertainties in our age grid. And so in this case, um, these uncertainties are not in fact derived uh, using uh, the Hellinger and Chang method, simply because we haven't got around to applying this methodology uh, to all our data. Right? And on top of this, of course, we have large areas. Um, for example, if you look at the um, uh, central um, uh, Atlantic, the equatorial Atlantic, you notice uh, that the uncertainties go up. The uncertainties there of uh, our um, age grid are up to 9, 10 million years, as opposed to just 1 or 2 million years or 3 maybe for most of the rest of the Atlantic. And just this, this just reflects that the um, magnetic field uh, uh, vector is more or less horizontal um, at the equator, and that makes it uh, quite difficult to uh, in a north-south spreading, uh, in a north-south oriented ridge system that's east-west spreading, so that makes it very difficult to recognize magnetic anomalies because essentially the magnetic field vectors are aligned uh, uh, with the long axes of the magnetized blocks um, east and west of the of the ridge axis, and so. Um, uh, this is maybe a, a little bit of an extra justification why we use a different methodology uh, to compute our global uncertainties because in fact we need to have some way of specifying uncertainties in areas where we haven't got any data. Right? Um, and so uh, one of the criteria we use to come up with this grid is the distance uh, uh, to the nearest uh, magnetic anomaly identification. So the further we go away uh, from uh, data points, uh, the uncertainties increase. And you see this, for example, also in the Bay of Bengal, um, east of India, where we have large uncertainties because we are far away 
from the closest uh, data points. And in the equatorial Pacific, you also see large uncertainties for the same reason. And so all the little white dots in this uh, image are our magnetic anomaly identifications. And, and again, you can see that in some areas where we have, lot, we have lots and lots of data, for example, west of North America, in the, in the Northeast Pacific, and the, the North and Central Atlantic is probably the best mapped um, area of uh, ocean flow in the world. And even the South Atlantic uh, has much sparser data coverage than the North Atlantic. The Indian Ocean is even sparser. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's move on to the next slide. So uh, this is now a movie, right? And uh, next I want to get into talking about reconstructing ocean basins and the age of the ocean basins. So this is a movie that was uh, produced by Mark Ross, who was, uh, uh, who is now a shell, but this was produced many years ago. And <coughs> what he did is he uh, took up the age grid of the ocean basins and reconstructed it back through time, back to about 180 million years ago. And what strikes you, uh, from watching this map is that how quickly the colors disappear. So you only have to go back uh, maybe to the um, uh, early tertiary. Uh, once you're in the late Cretaceous, you're, you've hardly got any ocean floor left uh, that's preserved today. Right? And so this, uh, this movie very nicely and visually illustrates the challenge that we are facing uh, for um, reconstructing the ocean basins back through time. because. We have to make some inference uh, about that ocean, those areas of ocean floor that now no longer exist. Right? <coughs> and, uh, and of course, the uncertainties uh, go up as you go back uh, through time. So, uh, so what we do to, to address this problem is, um, what, well, first we use um, uh, um, in those areas of ocean floor in the Pacific where we have one ridge flank preserved but not the other, then we assume a symmetry of spreading. Uh, which we know is a reasonable assumption overall, and, uh, uh, and uh, reconstruct the now subducted uh, ocean floor uh, using this methodology. Now, there are other areas that are even more challenging, uh, which is the uh, Tethys, uh, the ancient, uh, the proto Indian Ocean um, that, that existed uh, when uh, uh, Pangaea was still assembled, uh, uh, that separated. Uh, Australia and India from uh, from uh, Eurasia, and you can see this big white blob sitting there quite well. So, in the next few slides, we're going to go through uh, 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 some ocean floor reconstructions. So, if we advance to the next slide, uh, then uh, you see um, um, four time slices of our oceanic Paleo Age area distribution: 30, 60, 90, and 120 million years ago. And so this is our best guess uh, at the moment. Of course, it might not be correct uh, for what the um, uh, age area distribution might have looked like back through time. And you, you notice that uh, if you go all the way back to 120 million years, that you had a, a huge and fast spreading mid ocean ridge system in the Pacific. Uh, that's a, a big red triangle uh, with the triangular Pacific plate in the middle and surrounded um, by the uh, Farallon plate to the east the Phoenix Plate to the south and the Izanagi Plate to the northwest. Um, and uh, uh, so in the, in, the, in the Tethys, you see we have filled in the Tethys as well. And so this was more challenging um, because uh, uh, we, we, we had to reconstruct the ocean floor that's now entirely subducted and uh, uh, where neither ridge flank is preserved. Right? And so I'll tell you in a minute how we've done that. And so the little uh, inset globes uh, that are shown on this slide uh, are our reconstructed uncertainty estimates, right? And so uh, the, the areas that are red on these inset globes uh, uh, represent those areas of ocean floor uh, uh, that, that are now subducted, that, that we somehow had to extrapolate where we had to create synthetic plates or parts of plates, right, to, to, to uh, reconstruct the globe. Um, and of course, you can see this bright red area and it becomes larger and larger um, as we go back through time. But let's, uh, let's move forward and have a look how we actually reconstructed the tethys um, so, uh, and associated bits of Southeast Asia. So here's just a present day view of Southeast Asia. It's of course uh, one of the most complex uh, tectonic um, areas uh, on Earth. Um, and uh, so south of 
to the trench system that's outlined there, you have the Indian Ocean with the water basin and the Argoib as a plain uh, off the northwest shelf of Australia. Right? So in fact, the Argoib as a plain, if we move to the next slide, uh, is the um, only remnant bit um, of uh, Jurassic Tethys Ocean floor. Actually, that's not quite true um, because the Somali Basin um, uh, between Africa and Madagascar on the other side of the Indian Ocean, uh, we, we think was once connected uh, to the Argo as a plain um, <clears throat> with the large mid ocean ridge system that's now gone. And so, what's shown here is a messy slide and it shows uh, the magnetic anomalies along track and, uh, and in color uh, we've overlain. Uh, some uh, in, in color we have overlain uh, uh, fracture zone traces and isochrons, and so this is based uh, on the work of my ex PhD student Christian Heine. Um, and if we now move to the next slide, then uh, you'll see um, our reconstructed isochrons uh, uh, for, for this area um, uh, in the Argo as a plane. Um, now, <clears throat> And another, this is a good example for another uh, piece of uh, data that we have used to uh, underpin our model. On the right-hand side of the slide, uh, you see two tectonic subsidence curves. And so this is based from on exploration well information. And so these are both from the TMRC. And the, uh, the reason why we included those wells in our analysis is that we expect there to be a correlation uh, be, between a transition from fast sun rift to slow uh, post-rift subsidence. So we expect a kink in the tectonic subsidence curves of sedimentary basins. And you see this, uh, these two kinks very well in these two subsidence curves, and they're uh, at the right edge of the gray bar <coughs> that's shown in these two graphs. And so we use these, um, uh, these curves to, <coughs> uh, to ensure that we have uh, um, picked the age of breakup uh, correctly because we can extrapolate back <coughs> towards the continental margin <coughs> using our magnetic data, and at the same time we can then use exploration wells to try to verify uh, these models. If we move to the next slide, yeah, uh, uh, you now see um, um, a geological map of, uh, 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 part of an area that's now partly part of Thailand and China and India, and so this is a, um, a, a tectonic um, a melange of different uh, bits and pieces, uh, in, uh, in, including uh, the West Boma block and a little piece that's called the Sibomazu platelet. Right? And uh, so what's interesting about this area is the geologists who have uh, looked at the geology in this area, um, as well as uh, that of the Northwest Shelf of Australia, have come to the conclusion that you, that you see the very same sediments here. These are Triassic uh, rift sediments, and uh, so we are pretty sure um, that there's a sliver in here which was once part of Australia. Right? So this is very valuable for us because um, we can not only can we correlate uh, 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 this so-called West Borma block uh, with the geology from the Northwest Shelf, um, we, we also know a lot about the time when this block was accreted here, because there's metamorphic data um, that uh, that show that uh, peak, con peak metamorphic conditions uh, were set up here between the late Cretaceous and the and the Eocene. So we have some uh, idea uh, of uh, when this uh, piece collided here, right? And so this is important for reconstructing this part of the Tethys where we have so little data because we are pretty sure that there was a block here that once belonged to Australia that crossed the entire Tethys Ocean and was then accreted um, uh, in the latest Cretaceous likely uh, to Eurasia. And so these are additional pieces of evidence, this is also underpinned by paleomagnetic data, that, that, that we use uh, to, to reconstruct the age area distribution of ocean basins because of course while this happened there was an ocean basin, a spreading ridge, that separated this piece from, north, uh, from the northwest shelf of Australia. Um, and uh, uh, so, so this is a good example for how we uh, have to integrate geological information uh, from overriding plates um, with seafloor data to reconstruct ocean floor that's, uh, that's now subducted. So the Tethys is an example where we have lots of the platelets like that, that have been rifted off the uh, north of Wonderland margin, crossed the uh, Tethys, and were then accreted to Eurasia. Um, and so th th we have used this methodology 
uh, um, also to uh, reconstruct the western parts of the Tethys. And the next slide now shows <coughs> a number of uh, reconstructed globes of age area distributions of the Tethys area um, that uh, is based on uh, Christian Heine's uh, work. And this is uh, from a paper in AGU monograph on uh, Southeast Asia. And so it starts in the Jurassic 160 million years ago on the upper left and ends at zero at present day uh, on the lower right. And so what's shown here in, in colors is not the geological age, but the paleo age of the ocean floor. So what's shown in bright red here is where we had active mid-ocean ridges at a given time. Right? Um, and so, um, um, and so the, the, the dark blue colors in, in this instance uh, don't mean Jurassic everywhere, but it means that the ocean floor uh, was, uh, say, above 150 million years old at a given time. Um, and so, what you can see here, if you if you look at uh, um, yeah, if you look at the reconstructions uh, at uh, 140 and 120, uh, you see this little label WB West Burma. There's this little gray dot that's moving across the Tethys, and you have um, an, an old uh, 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 ocean basin that's being subducted north of the West Burma block, and you have a new ocean basin. That at 140, we have this bright red mid ocean ridge that's wrapping around uh, uh, from not just north of Australia to north of India into the Somali basin. And we think that this mid ocean ridge system became extinct um, and jumped to the south, namely into the uh, uh, opening, the rift system between India and Australia and Antarctica to eventually form the Indian Ocean as we know it today. And we think that this jump happened and the, aband the abandoning of this ridge system. Uh, that we still see at 140 north of India, it happened maybe because of the Kerguelen plume. Right? Uh, so it's conceivable that this uh, ridge system jumped to the south because it jumped towards the Kerguelen plume uh, that uh, that uh, that arrived sometime maybe uh, before 120 million years, um, and uh, 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 that uh, uh, therefore the Mid Ocean Ridge north of India was removed because it became extinct. And the lack of a subsequent mid-ocean ridge north of India, in fact, enabled India to move north as far as it did, because it was now attached to a subducting slab to the north, instead of having a mid-ocean ridge uh, sitting to the north that would have exerted a ridge push force on it. So we, we are trying to, so when, when we reconstruct uh, uh, um, ocean basins through time, uh, so we, we we not only use the data from the seafloor, we use the uh, geological data from overriding plates, and we also think about plate driving forces. Right? We look at the absolute motion of plates through time, and uh, we think about, well, it doesn't make any sense. Right? We, we wouldn't want to have India moving north extremely fast and having it surrounded by mid-ocean ridges at the same time, because then it would just be sitting around like Africa today, not going anywhere. Okay, so if we move to the next slide, and this is another representation um, of the same story. Uh, so we, uh, uh, as part of our G-Plate software development, this is uh, in collaboration with Mike Garnes' group at Caltech and John Torsvig at the Norwegian Geological uh, Survey at the University of Oslo. Um, we have developed software uh, to close plate polygons so that we know the changing shapes of plates at any given time. So then that allows us to uh, compute um, plate um, um, velocities so the plate velocity vectors are shown um, for, um, for, for three uh, one million year long stages around 61, uh, 53 and 48 million years. And so we, can, uh, we use these velocity um, grids partly to drive geodynamic mantle convection models, but they are also um, um, uh, instructive uh, to, to look at uh, in, in terms of um, how the absolute motion of individual plates is changing through time. So what's shown here is now the absolute motion, not the relative motion of different plates relative to each other, but the but the absolute actual motion uh, in the hotspot, so in a moving hotspot reference frame in this instance uh, um, of uh, of all the plates relative to a fixed reference frame, i.e., the spin axis of the Earth. So if we look at the next uh, slide that shows an animation, so this animation of <coughs> our resulting um, age area distribution of ocean flow through time. Um, uh, is, uh, uh, there's various uh, aspects to this. 
that, that, that's so contentious, especially um, our reconstruction of the large ridge system um, surrounding the Pacific plate is subject to large uncertainties. And uh, that we, we know as it is that there are lots of complications in the Pacific that have not been taken into account here. And so, in fact, we are, we, we are hoping uh, to rectify some of this uh, by working uh, with your group in, in, uh, in Hawaii um, over the next few years. And so, uh, what you see is this huge mid ocean ridge system uh, in the Pacific uh, that evolves in the beginning when the Pacific is still a triangle. We see that now uh, again here. And this, this uh, fast spreading ridge system uh, grows larger and larger until. Uh, uh, the uh, ridges start uh, being subducted uh, again, and you see that where the Izanagi Pacific Ridge is uh, subducted underneath uh, Eurasia. Um, and if we just watch, and you see all the backyard basins in the West Pacific developing uh, now, this is all based on um, uh, my postdoc Maria Seaton's work. Um, and what you also see in the Tethys, you see the old uh, Meso Tethys disappearing uh, north of the West Burma block, and then the Eventually, all the tethys is gone, and the uh, Indian Ocean forms as we know it today. And so, <clears throat> this kind of uh, representation of the ocean basins through time uh, then allows us to do all sorts of other things. Um, uh, uh, for example, we can then uh, convert age to heat flow or age to depth, and look at other problems. But the next two slides um, just uh, illustrate again how we try to use uh, geological data. If we move to the next slide. Um, uh, so as I mentioned before, one of the more sort of contentious uh, aspects of these reconstructions that, uh, that may be revised in the future as well is uh, what exactly was the geometry of the Izanagi Pacific Ridge um, before it became subducted and when, it, uh, when did it become subducted. And so we, we then use data like the known metamorphism of the Ryoka Belt in southern Japan. And uh, the problem is, of course, that these data are never um, entirely clear cut. So there are all sorts of um, um, different interpretations that have been offered uh, to explain this high temperature, low pressure, a Ryoko belt uh, metamorphism. Um, and if we if we move to the uh, next slide, um, so there are various other geological evidence um, available for Japan. <clears throat> There's also other evidence from South Korea that's not <clears throat> not summarized here right now. So. Not only can we look at metamorphism on the overriding plate, we can also look at um, the accretion of tectonic terrains through time. So, for example, uh, there was a, a the major accretion phase in the Cretaceous, uh, and that um, ceased in the in the latest Cretaceous. And so we um, took that as evidence um, that, uh, that, together with this uh, very hot, buoyant material. Um, that was uh, apparently present when the so-called Okitsu Melange was in place there. We took that as evidence that the Mid-Ocean Ridge was subducted in the early tertiary. And as one can also look at structural information, such as cross-cutting fault fabrics from the overriding plate. And so these are, and one can look at paleo pressure, paleo thermal data. So there's a rich inventory of geological data from overriding plates that can be used in conjunction uh, with subduction models uh, in an iterative fashion. Uh, to slowly refine these models. So if we now uh, move on to the next uh, slide, um, one of the things that we have done is we have uh, converted the paleo age of the ocean floor to paleo depth. And uh, we don't have time to go into the details of, of that today, um, but uh, 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 again, there's also um, various problems associated with that. First, uh, you need to pick a depth age curve, and, and uh, this is of course one of one of the issues that is still not settled as to uh, how um, uh, unperturbed ocean floor that's unperturbed by dynamic topography or other thermal processes, uh, how does it actually subside uh, through time uh, when it gets older than 80 or 100 million years? Uh, so that's one uncertainty in these reconstructions. Um, if we actually want to reconstruct uh, paleo depth properly, we also have to reconstruct. Uh, sediment thickness in the oceans and large igneous provinces. Um, we have actually tried to do that as well. We're not really going to get into that uh, today. But the three plots um, uh, at the bottom of the slide show um, the uh, paleo depth distribution of the ocean floor at 130, 80, and 40 million years. Um, and one of the things you notice, uh, just taking these reconstructions at face value, is that the Earth has become more blue through time. So it was more orangey 
uh, in the uh, Cretaceous, right? Of course, orange colors are shallow depths uh, in these representations, and blue colors uh, are the abyssal depths, right? So the shallow colors are mid-ocean ridge at uh, depth two and a half kilometers, etc. And so what this tells us is uh, that the, uh, just visually, uh, and of course we can compute this easily as well, is uh, that the average depth of the ocean floor was in fact shallower in the Cretaceous than it is today, or than it was in the mid or late tertiary. Right? And so the graph on top, in fact, uh, um, uh, uh, tracks the mean age, the change in the mean age of the ocean floor, starting at 140 million years on the right uh, to the present on the left. And uh, of course, the mean age and the mean depth are related uh, to each other. Um, and uh, so if we just look at the mean age, we can see that the global mean age uh, has uh, increased from about 37 million years at 120 to 64 million years at present. That's an increase of 27 million years in the mean age. So that's pretty significant, right? And no matter uh, exactly whose depth age curve we use, we will always come to the conclusion that the ocean basins must have been substantially shallower uh, in the in the Cretaceous because of this huge mean age difference, right? And so the next slide, in fact, uh, illustrates the different components of uh, um, that make a contribution um, to the mean depth of the ocean floor through time. So the the blue curve uh, on the uh, that's the lower part of this graph. So we have time going from the left to the right now, and we have the mean depth on the y-axis. So the, the light blue area shows us just a model increase of mean basement depth uh, from 140 million years uh, to the present. And so, so if we just compute the pure basement depth, never mind sediments or um, uh, uh, changes in crustal thickness due to large igneous provinces, uh, oceanic plateaus, uh, we would get um, an increase in mean basement depth of 380 meters. Right? Uh, from 120 million years to uh, to the uh, um, um, to the to the to the present, right? Um, now, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, the, the, or unfortunately, there are two processes that alleviate uh, uh, this. Namely, uh, as ocean floor ages, it collects more sediment. So, as you make the average ocean floor deeper and older, the sediments also become thicker. And so that the, the increase in sediment thickness counteracts the increase in depth associated with increased mean age. Right? And by the same token, as ocean floor ages and moves around, uh, it has more of a chance to run uh, over a hotspot, over a mantle plume uh, that, will, that will create large igneous provinces in one way or another. And so, um, so as ocean floor shifts around through the ocean basins, it accumulates large igneous provinces as well. Right? Some of which may be subducted, but still the net effect is an increase. Right? And so uh, these three components are um, separated here in this graph. Right? And, uh, and so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the net effect of all this is still a net depth increase of 260 uh, meters. Uh, and, but even that is not the, and of course this drives long-term sea level variation in the ocean basins. But even this 260 meters is still an overestimate. And uh, one of the things that we haven't considered here yet is the change in oceanic area through time. Because as the supercontinent Pangaea falls apart, uh, in fact the continental area increases because continental crust is stretched out. And uh, one might argue that the, that, the, the, that the stretched crust then subsides and creates accommodation space, but most of this accommodation space is in fact filled up with sediments. So the net effect uh, as time goes by is an increase in continental area um, at the expense of the oceanic area. So we're not going to talk about that here, but if you take all these factors into account, then you can actually uh, start taking a guess as to how long-term sea level changes might have been driven by changes in the volume of the ocean basins. And so there's a paper that uh, came out in Science uh, in March this year, uh, where, where this is sort of all detailed. So there's only one more slide to go. This is our last slide, right, which is um, an animation of the uh, paleo depth uh, of the ocean floor through time. And so the, the depth uh, view brings out the mid-ocean ridges a little bit more sharply uh, than the age. And so uh, so this is, in fact, what we would call paleo uh, and This is not actually uh, it's wrongly labeled. It's not actually depth to uh, basement. Uh, in fact, this is a combination of uh, 
uh, basement depth, our estimates of sediment thickness through time, and large igneous provinces uh, through time as well. And you can download lots of these things, movies, images, PDFs of papers uh, from earthbyte.org. And that's the end of my talk.